I was thinking this week a bit about uh, communication, actually, and uh, thinking about how it's, you know, really been central to our experience uh, of the pandemic over the last year, you know, things that we've just leaned really heavily on, you know, that technology that didn't exist, you know, even a short time ago, I was thinking about when I was a kid, it was like, yeah, we didn't have, you know, all these technologies. And it was like, if you wanted to communicate with somebody really you had to, you know, at a distance, you had to pick up the phone. And even then, I, I don't know about you, but I remember like the long distance rates when I was a kid and, and my mom especially had a, a sister that she would call pretty frequently through the week, but they were always waiting for 601, you know, the magic hour when, when uh, long distance rates became cheap. And, and if there's a real emergency, you, I immediately knew it because uh, Auntie Muriel would be calling before six o'clock and there'd be sort of a short clipped conversation and then, okay, we'll talk, talk later. Um, or, or, um, even more so actually, uh, Tabitha was telling about, um, you know, when she was a kid, like her, she had two grandparents that were in Pakistan and it was like, I forget she, uh, the exact figure, but it was somewhere between three and $10 a minute to, to call. And you'd often have to go through like four or five operators to get through before you'd find that. And it wasn't always a great connection. So it was like this you know, very rare treat when they'd actually get to, to talk with her, her grandparents that way. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. There was a lot more letter writing then. And, and it's funny, like, you know, I, I think back to even my own childhood then growing up, it's like, yeah, that that factored in. You know, I remember sneaking mom and dad's calling card uh, when I was dating Tabitha so I could, you know, make some phone calls on their dime. Now it's like a calling card. What? What is that? Like, why? What doesn't make easy? But even in in high school, like as internet came along, e- you had email and that sort of supplanted a bit of that. But I remember too, like, um, there's this kind of moment in high school, and, and it might be familiar to some of us, uh, like uh, the inst- when instant messaging became a big thing. It was like I remember a few girls, like you know, kind of making their way every lunch hour to the computer lab so they could instant message different people and it was just this this big thing or you'd, you'd get on like a, a message board just so you could talk to some stranger cause, for the novelty of it you know because they were on the other side of the world um, and, and it's just kind of interesting to me how all these things have evolved you know to the point where we have social media you're you know you're interacting with a lot of uh, sort of your your circle of friends that way and, and even things like zoom and facetime where you're interacting sort of face to face and and like it keeps to me it keeps creeping closer and closer to to actually being with a person but even in the middle of that I think we're all kind of at the point where it's like yeah but it doesn't it's not the same you know uh, the same as you know having three or four friends over for a cup of coffee and just interacting with somebody in your living room face to face it's it's not quite the same and so I think we're we're all anticipating that moment where we get to take our masks off and and be in each other's physical space a little more than you know six feet. <laughs> what what a privilege I will be! And and I think everybody in in Canada and North America around the world is kind of holding their breath for that moment. And, and it's that moment that I want to that that need that I want us to look at a bit. Uh, this morning, just as we think about how are we going to re-engage our community, particularly as a church and as Christians, we're, you know, we're anticipating the end of the pandemic and what's that going to look like? And so we're anticipating that, yeah, there's going to be this moment where we're all going to be really hungry for that social interaction, for that social interaction where we can sort of, okay, if I can desanctify the word, when we can commune with other people. Um, and so, so I think it's, it's helpful for us to think a little bit about that as Christians and and pause a bit this morning, just to, to think about how are we going to go about that? How are we going to go about reconnecting with our community? And and I'm thinking mainly here for us as how do we going to connect with the community outside our walls? I, I think as a church, we pretty naturally understand some of the things that we like to do, you know, as uh, God's people to to connect with each other, whether it's small groups or or just potluck every weekend. We, I I think we have a good grasp on 
sort of some habits that we've been, we've been really good at, but I want us to think a bit about how we're going to engage our community. And so I have a few texts that I think will help us along the way this morning. Uh, but first off, I think it's helpful to acknowledge that we are part of a larger community. Uh, we're, we're connected to people outside our walls, whether we like it or not. Um, you know, as the old saying goes, you can choose your, your neighbors, sorry, you can choose your house, but you can't choose your neighbors. And, and there's a reality to that, that yeah, you know, as much as we uh, maybe don't like our neighbors sometimes, we're, we're connected. And in fact, God has called us to love our neighbor, regardless of who they may be. So how do we deal with that reality as Christians? Well, first, I want to flip over to the Gospel of John just for a few verses in chapter 17, just that I think highlights some of the tension that we sometimes feel when we're trying to love a neighbor who isn't like us in many ways, who and, and may certainly not be a, a follower of Christ. And I think Jesus in chapter 17, kind of underlines this really well when he prays for his disciples and, and I think ultimately us as well. Uh, chapter 17, verses 13 to 17 say this. I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they, my disciples, may have the full measure of my joy within them. I've given them your word and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. So, Jesus underlines that the, the, there's an essential purity to walking with him. That as, as followers of Jesus Christ, we're to be in the word. We're to purify ourselves through it from unrighteousness. But he says, I'm not in the same breath. He says, but I, I, I want them to be a witness to the world, but I don't want you as disciples to come out of the world. So, so there's a tension that's kind of set up. We're in, we're in a world that, that hates us as, as followers of Christ, or as we'd understand as, you know, antithetical to what we believe. So it's, it's not condu always conducive to faith. And yet Jesus says, you're in that world and I want you to remain pure. And so then the, the question for us becomes, well, then how do we interact with the world around us that is sometimes hostile to our faith? Do we, do we return that hostility? Or maybe we just, you know, bring it down to a low-grade hostility that's just more like distance and indifference towards uh, our neighbors around us? Do we seek to embrace our neighbor? Maybe, maybe drawing them in close and, and maybe even disguising a bit of, of what we believe to, to smooth over the rough patches. Do we try to camouflage with the world so we can blend in? And I think it's as we ask those questions that I want to get to sort of one of our main texts this morning, which is in Jeremiah chapter 29. Um, a lot of us might be familiar with the chap chapter 29 uh, for a few critical verses, uh, as Certainly years of youth ministry brought them, them up in, in the lives of teens I was working with. But I actually want to focus on the bit, the first bit of chapter 29 that comes before some of the more well-known verses about God knowing plans for us. Jeremiah 29 kind of comes at a critical moment for the community of Israel as God's people. Um, Jeremiah has um, foretold the exile and now it's beginning. And, and, and he's already told the, the people in exile, you're going to be there in Babylon for 70 years. 70 years is, is a long time. It's a lifetime for most people. And so they're quite uncomfortable. A lot of them are uncomfortable with this idea because it doesn't square with their idea of being God's people. That, that they would be off in exile being punished for this for their whole lifetime. And so there's false prophets that have risen up among the people and said, no, you're not going to be here. Uh, don't don't get comfortable. Don't settle in. You, you start making plans to rebel. They you meet your world with hostility and make your own way. 
And, and Jeremiah knows that they're going to be there for 70 years. So he, he writes them a letter, actually, to warn them. And, and this is what we have in chapter 29. Uh, verse 1 says, This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jehoiachin and the queen mother, the court officials, and the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the skilled workers and the artisans had gone into exile from Jerusalem. He entrusted the letter to El- Elisa, son of Shaphan, and to Gemariah, son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. Say that ten times fast. Uh, <laughs> it said, here we go. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it. Because if it prospers, you too will prosper. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not Sent them, declares the Lord. A few years ago, my um, hometown actually tried, took a, a run at rebranding itself. And they came up with a little t- town motto that's on all the uh, the signs. And it gives us all, a, a, at least I guess of a certain age, a bit of a giggle. They're t- I think they're trying to encourage people, you know, especially young families, to come and, and make a home there. But the town motto is just two words. Settle down. <laughs> and so, of course, there, you know, there's some obvious double meaning there. So anytime, you know, some little tempest in a teapot flares up on town council, the, the town motto comes out, settle down. Um, but, but it's interesting to me that that's kind of, you know, in both those ways, I think that's kind of Jeremiah's advice for the, the people of Israel. Settle down, you know, in, in some sense, Make a home for your family. Get comfortable here because it's going to be a while, but also settle down. This isn't a time for conflict. And so then he, of course, that's the beginning of his letter. And and the end of what we read, of course, is against these prophets who have been prophesying lies and saying, oh, you're going to, you're only going to be here a short time. But, but sandwiched in between there is, I think, some really helpful instruction, of course, for the people of Israel, but also for us as God's people. And it, and it just simply says, Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. And that word peace, of course, is familiar to us. Uh, In the Old Testament, we might know that that Hebrew word is shalom. And, And we also know that it has a wider meaning than just the absence of conflict. He's not just saying, put down your weapons. But interestingly, even in Jeremiah's letter there, where we translate prosperity and prospers and prosper, those, that's just a repetition of that word, actually. It keeps coming up. Shalom, 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 shalom. Jeremiah keeps saying to the people, this is what you're after. Peace, wholeness, completeness, not just for you, but he says for your community. And he says when you, when you pray that for your city, then you will prosper because it's prospering as well. And and I think he's getting at that essential connectedness that we cannot avoid when when we live with other people, whether we like it or not. And and we realize that there's a bit of a reciprocal relationship there, that that as I prosper, as, as I find wholeness, I can share that with my community. And as I work toward wholeness in the community that I live, it benefits me as well. And, and, you know, Tim Keller uh, helpfully points out that, you know, especially in larger centers, you you start to rub shoulder with people that don't believe the same thing as you. And 
and you realize that actually there's there's maybe some goodness out there that I can I can sort of tap into that's not within my own faith community. And I, and I think that's, you know, Jesus even draws that out. You know, it's it's a, an interesting tradition of sort of the ro- righteous outsider is, uh, you know, planted right there even in some of his most famous parables. You know, think about the Good Samaritan. He's the good guy. He's the hero in the story. He helps out the fellow that's down and out. And it's shocking because the Samaritan has wrong theology. He doesn't believe the right things about God, even according to Jesus, as he'll tell the woman at the well. And and the interesting thing is he's the hero of the story. He does the right thing and he goes his way and he still believes the wrong stuff about God at the end of the day. And I think that's a word for us in, in thinking about how can we partner even with other people in our community? Can, can we join forces with somebody that just wants to do something good? You know, maybe it's brighten up the gardens of Bonacord through Communities in Bloom or, or, you know, Brenda's leading the way for us working with the library. You know, if we have similar goals in that way, maybe we don't have to believe all the exact same things as everybody else. And we might be surprised by what can happen. You know, I was, I was surprised actually um, yesterday morning. I, I got home and had to tell Tabitha about um, just the the grocery clerk that I'd, I'd had at uh, Superstore. I, I thought you, after the fact, it's like that woman's talents are being wasted. Well, maybe not wasted, but, uh, you know, it could easily be some kind of priest, I think. Uh just cashier at, at Superstore. We we got to chatting after she'd rung my order through, you know, taught COVID grocery experience. So I was there bagging everything and she just kind of had to wait, right? So asking, go, we got talking some small talk and then she was just asking after my family. I said, I had four young boys and she says, oh, God bless you. And just kind of goes in, you know, how important it is, especially to have a father providing security uh, and stability in the home and and just, you know, really encouraging me in it. And I came away from this this experience of buying groceries just blessed. And, and it's like I wasn't expecting that. You know, I I don't usually talk with cashiers too much at grocery stores. Uh, that's that's my own obeying the golden rule just because I hated making small tack, talk as a grocery clerk. Um, and and so it's, it's not that I don't like talking to them. I just don't usually engage that way. And here this woman kind of stepped out and just really blessed me. And, and I think we're maybe be surprised when we engage our larger community that, that there is a blessing for us too, as we can bless others also. But I thought, you know, what a juxtaposition. Here I am, the pastor, going out, you know, interacting with people. I I don't know what she believed or what her her, you know, if she was a Christian or, or a Muslim or what. And, and yet she was a blessing to me, certainly. So we're connected to a larger community. And, and Jeremiah sort of instructs us, yeah, that's an essential part of who you are as God's people. And, and, and that it's okay to sort of go for, to aim for the common good, as it were. The, that Those are good things to pursue. And yet there's also a, a, a sense that as God's people, we have something unique to offer. So there's good things we can do, but there's certainly a best thing we can do, and that's in proclaiming the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and I want to flip now to the New Testament. Obviously, that's where we're going to hear a bit about that. And in Acts chapter 17, um, we, we have just, I want to look at just a short snippet of one of Paul's sermons because he, I think, unpacks this really well. And it, he's in the city of Athens. Uh, he's preaching to a, a crowd of people that largely know nothing about his Jewish theology or what he believes about Jesus. And so he really starts out, you know, from, from a place of common belief uh, that they, so they can understand what he's saying. And so I just want to read uh, chapter 17 of Acts, verses 24 to 28. And Paul preaches this. He says, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives life, everyone life and breath and everything else. Now here's, I think, the critical part for us as we're thinking this morning. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. 
and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. What is this unique thing that we have to contribute to our community? It's the gospel. It's, it's a relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and Paul points this out in, in pretty plain terms. You know, I, we look back over the last little better than a year and we think, oh, what a, what a mess the pandemic has made of our lives. And yet Jesus looks at us as it was no mistake. You know, it was not a surprise to God that any of this took place. It, it's not, a, it's not a, just a random occurrence that we happen to be alive during it. And for all of us, you know, Jesus says it's an opportunity to turn to God. Paul, Paul says, you know, the, the circumstances of your life and where you, you live are all put in place so that perhaps we can reach out and find God. And it's good news. And, and I think at, at the end of the day, that's one of the first things that we have to realize afresh is that the gospel is good news for us. You know, I think uh, even, you know, circumstances of my life and people I know, you know it's like just remembering that yeah for a, a tween in in southern BC growing up kind of self-righteous going to church hearing the gospel was still good news even though it kind of makes you eat some humble pie and realize you're not as good as you think you are now, that was me growing up or, or I think of Tabitha you know driving home from a a neighbor's barn that had burned down and wondering what had happened to the cats inside. It was good news to hear about Jesus Christ at that point. And it's not too hard to imagine, actually, other times, other places, other people where the gospel becomes good news. Maybe it's you're just a, a lonely girl from a rough home. The gospel of Jesus Christ be good news. A, a mom just trying to figure her way through life and, and find support in this little community bon accord. Maybe, maybe in that situation, hearing the gospel is good news. I think as a church, we, we want to be in a place of saying, yeah, in all of those situations, maybe we can help. You know, maybe there's some support we can provide. That's, those are good things, being, being the good Samaritan. But I think it's important to say, and there's even something better. The, the life that we can have in Jesus. The gospel is something immeasurably better. And, and I just want to pause there this morning and, and, and remind us, you know, as we hear all this, it's like, yeah, we want to engage with our community and, and we want to share the gospel, but, but we have to be in a place where we really value it ourselves. I've uh, discovered I'm kind of cyclical, I think, in my devotional habits. And so I'm I'm getting back into something that I did actually as a teen and had thought I'd kind of left behind, but I'm, I've found myself reading devotional books again. Uh, and maybe my taste has changed a little bit, but, uh, but I find it really instructive. And I've been in, in using one um, written by uh, an associate pastor down in California. And it's his, his basic premise is just that we need to preach the gospel to ourselves. And it's, it's kind of directed even at pastors a bit, just to say, you know what, the gospel isn't just something that we share with people who've, who've never heard it before and, and kind of move through these motions of the sinner's prayer and then leave behind. He says, no, we need to, every life circumstance, we need to preach the gospel to our own hearts and be reminded that we stand strong in the grace of Jesus Christ in, in whatever life circumstance we come to. And, and it's just real helping me come back to that truth in my own life of, yeah, it's good news for me even. That, that it's, it's God's grace that allows me to thrive in whatever circumstance that I'm in. And, and the gospel is what helps me grow. It's not something that I've grown past. It's something I'm growing into. And, and I think as we realize that, then we can, we can all kind of get to that place, you know, Jesus' parables. You know, the, the, the kingdom of heaven is, 
is something of immense value. It's like a pearl that you'd sell all your earthly possessions in order to possess. And so I, I want to just pause actually in this moment and pray a bit um, and, and just ask God to to ex- renew that value in all of our lives, that it, that it becomes something valuable, something sacred in our lives that, that we treasure. So just bow with me for a moment and we'll pray. Lord, we... We look at your gospel, Lord, and, and sometimes we're a little utilitarian about it as Christians and thinking, okay, what are the steps of telling somebody about it? And, and we're worried about the technicalities and the, the maybe the, the roadblocks to understanding for others, Lord. And, and we want to just pause in this moment and say, Lord, would you grow the kingdom of heaven, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ in our own lives? W- would that... Will we come, help us to esteem your your grace and your love for us more and more, Lord. That we would have a passion for what you're doing, Lord. For that your life in us wouldn't just be a a theological truth that we acknowledge, Lord. Or or maybe a a feel-good sensation that helps pick up our spirits, Lord. But that it would be life. And so we just pray that, that you would continue to pour out everything we need for life and godliness into our lives, Lord, that we be conformed more and more to the image of your son, Jesus Christ, and in doing so that we would just love you and, and love the gospel, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thinking of... Again, communication, actually, I just was um, thinking actually of a seminar that I took uh, this last December and uh, online, of course, through Zoom. And, and um, yeah, thankful for, you know, that technology in the midst of, of COVID, that some opportunities that I might have missed. But actually, interestingly, the seminar was entirely on sort of the online ministry that your church can have and, and how to make that most effective. And, and actually sitting through whatever it was, I think three or four hours of, of different sort of round table discussions they had. Um, it wasn't a lot in terms of online ministry that was super applicable to a small church. Um, and, and that was okay because actually the baseline message they gave was actually super helpful for me. Um, they the the pastor that was leading it, well, former pastor, Kerry Newoff from, from Ontario, he just said, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's not about garnering a lot of praise or followers necessarily for, for your online presence, you know, get publishing your sermon online and getting a million people to watch it actually is not the point. Uh, he said, at the end of the day, all of that is to drive relationship. You know, the, the point is not how many views you get, but how many people can you actually interact with? with off of that you know you post something on a blog maybe there's somebody who's curious about their faith and that begins a discussion with them and that was really helpful to say you know just saying it all needs to drive towards relationship Um, and the realization that yeah that's actually the whole point in anything we do as we minister as God's people as we seek to engage or re-engage our community you know whether it's just um whether it's, you know, just doing something good for somebody, you know, maybe a, a food hamper or something, or, or maybe even a little more direct in sharing the gospel with somebody, handing out tracts or going door to door even, something like that. At the end of the day, even that is not the end goal. The point is to build a relationship with somebody. And, and, and at the end of the day, to me, it's like, yeah, I think there's, a, there's something neat. I, I'm anticipating maybe a, a, a special moment for us as God's people where people are hungry for social interaction and, and, and being connected to each other. And, and I think as a Christian, I have an, a neat opportunity to say, yeah, I want to engage with my community that way. And in fact, the way I can be closest to somebody, and maybe I'm just a weird Christian pastor this way, but the closest I can be to somebody is when we both actually share fellowship in Jesus Christ. And so it's just really a natural way of connecting, actually, with, with somebody is, is to say, you know, this is great, and it could even be better, actually, in, as, as 
we gather around Jesus Christ and, and his love for us, there's, there's a foundational connection there that I can't, I can't mimic any other way. I can't describe any other way. And it's going to feed our souls in a way that actually even just social connection won't do. That there's something deeper going on there. And so I hope, you know, as we look to, to connect and reconnect with our community, re-engage our community in, in the months ahead as we hope, you know, restrictions ease and masks become a thing of the past. Uh, I, I hope that our engagement drives toward connection and, and fellowship and, and even pointing people to Jesus Christ. I know we just prayed, but let's let's end our service this morning in a word of prayer and, and ask God to, to lead us in that. Lord, we thank you for your word and your grace to us, Lord, that that our relationship with you can be fresh, Lord. Even as I prayed earlier about your mercies being new every morning, Lord, that there's, you're an infinite God and, and that we can serve you and, and walk with you and relate to you in new ways every single day of our lives, Lord. It's, it's a wonderful privilege. And Lord, we pray and ask that, that as we step into these moments now as a, a community of faith, in a certain place, meeting in Bon Accord, living here and, and out in Sturgeon County and different places, Lord, we, we pray that we would take the opportunity to re-engage our neighbors, Lord. Uh, maybe it's for old friends that, that we've not got to see much, or maybe it's just a familiar face that we've never really gotten to know before, Lord. Help us to take those opportunities to to build true and lasting friendships, not just for here and now or a few months, Lord, but for eternity in Jesus Christ. And and help us to see the value of the gospel in, in our lives, Lord, that, that we would be able to honestly tell somebody else, here's something pretty valuable that I treasure and, and I want you to have as well. Lord, we thank you for your grace and your peace, your your presence that, that goes with us and sends us out from this uh, building, Lord, with a, with a sense of purpose and, and determination to be part of your kingdom. In Jesus Christ's name.